Today is a great day where we learn about how to get into the United States during this corona crisis. And NIE is the name of the game. Those of who participate today and who speak German, and I see on the list of attendees, lots of my fellow German countrymen out, um, me means never. And we are showing today that it is not me as in never, it is me as in possible. And the person who's making it possible is Andrew Howe, my colleague and long-term NIE specialist, so to say, when it started this month, uh, when it started this year, Andrew Howe jumped on it to master the NIE situation. And I think right now, Andrew, we have a 100% success rate on our NIEs, and that's certainly a story to tell. So without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce Andrew Howe, attorney with Bridgehouse Law. Andrew, the floor is all yours. Good morning, Reinhardt. Thank you for the, uh, the uh, very, very uh, uh, wonderful introduction there. I, I hope to, uh, to do it justice. And um, good morning uh, here, and perhaps good evening or good afternoon to, uh, to uh, those who are watching this. Um, we appreciate you watching. Um, we hope to present some, some uh, valuable information relating to getting, um, to getting in the U.S. Um, as you've, many of you have likely experienced or, or read or heard about, um, this NIE process is, um, for, for many, many people outside the U.S., the, the only real way of getting in the U.S. in a timely um, in a reasonable manner without uh, great, great, great um, time, effort, and expense. So um, we actually did a similar presentation a few weeks ago. Some of you may have seen it, but that was a, an overview of, of all of the, um, the kind of exemptions and, and the requirements that have been enacted with, um, uh, with COVID or related to COVID, whereas this is simply going to drill down and focus on the specific NIE process to travel restrictions, be it from the, um, the UK, be it from Europe, be it from... Uh, Brazil or China or um, here locally, for example, dealing with uh, are you traveling from Canada or to Canada? Or are you traveling from, you know, or, or uh, to Mexico? So we're going to address some of those issues and how to get around them. So if you give me just one minute, let me screen share a presentation and we will, uh, we will start the substantive uh, work. By the way, um, if you have a question while we're talking something just burning on your mind, please feel free to ask. Um, Robert will help me moderate that. And um, of course, at the end, we'll also have a time for questions. So um, feel free to ask if, if you just really feel a need to based on what we're talking about, or if, um, if you want to wait to the end, or if something comes up at the end that you want to ask, we'll be glad to answer what we can. Give me just one second to screen share. Okay, and so again, we're going to be talking about how to use NIEs and other exemptions to enter the U.S. So as we outlined um, a few weeks ago, there are, with immigration, with really any immigration matter, there are three primary gatekeepers uh, with U.S. immigration law that um, if you enter the U.S., uh, any really any type of immigration matter, be it you're coming in as a visitor, or you're coming under ESTA, or you're coming in with an e-visa, or you're a green card holder or a potential green card holder, you're dealing with um, you know one or two or sometimes all three of these entities. So again, um, one being USCIS, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, they deal with most of the U.S. side issues. So if you're applying for a green card in the U.S. Um, you're going to be dealing with USCIS first, um, or likely first, and if you're, um, you know, applying for any type of visa change or altering, you're going to be dealing with uh, USCIS likely, Department of State or DOS. Again, as we know, and we'll, as we'll hear in this particular presentation, that's who we're primarily talking about to a large extent. If you're overseas, if you're abroad, um, even if you send an application to USCIS, you're likely to end up with a consulate or an embassy abroad in some form or fashion. And of course, uh, Customs and Border Protection, CPP. Um, if you're entering the US under any of these circumstances, you will eventually deal with CBP. So uh, it's just a good to keep these separate. And I think a really important point that we emphasized a few weeks ago is that 
these three entities do have different rules and not so much the verbiage, um, but the way they use those rules and the way they interpret those rules. And they are largely free to do that. So there can be um, some translation issues when dealing with, well, this entity said that, or this entity said this. So just bear in mind that when you're dealing with each entity, we do have to specifically look at what that entity is asking and what they do and their on the ground procedures. Um, I think also an important point, and it does certainly bear within IEs, is that even within these three entities, um, you're still dealing with people and people, and you're dealing with a uh, particular consulates or a particular embassy, or you're dealing with a particular point of entry. And so even at that uh, very granular level, there are differences, not so much again in, in, in overarching policy, but in, in practical on the ground day-to-day -day situations we have to address each one slightly differently. And so it's really important to remember if you're dealing with these entities, what worked for one consulate or worked at say, a, you know, a New York point of entry, port of entry may be slightly different at a different location. Okay, so specifically, what are we talking about here? So we're talking about COVID related entry restrictions on US entry and Primarily the ones we're gonna talk about are the ones listed here. So Presidential Proclamation 9984, Presidential Proclamation 9992, 9993, 9996, um, 10,041. And um, though they're not specifically tied to Presidential Proclamations, there's been some rulemaking and some, some policy setting with how to deal with the US borders with Mexico and Canada. And those have largely been mutual agreements. So Canada and the U.S. get together and decide what they're going to do at the border. Mexico and the U.S. do. And basically, it's the same policy across the board. Um, really important point and something that comes up a lot when we get questions about NIEs and about travel you know, to Canada or to Mexico is that this does not deal with or address restrictions in those other countries. So just because you can... Um, fly from Canada to the U.S., as we're going to learn, that does not mean you can fly to Canada. Um, and in fact, I was, I was reading uh, just last night, and kind of ahead of this, is that Canada has now, um, as we'll learn, you can fly from Canada to the U.S. Canada has decided that it's not something they're going to really continue in substantive effect. So um, you really need to dial into can I actually get to the country I'm trying to get to? And then of course, this is more about, can I get back? Can I get back to the US? So just a really important point, being able to enter the US from a particular location does not mean that you can get to that location or another location without um, following that local or that regional or, or uh, national requirement. So scope, really important, what is covered? And um, interestingly, it is quite different based on what we're looking, you know, the particular, um, the particular restriction we're talking about. Um, the the, the, the pro prohibition sign, the, uh, the, the no sign, whatever you want to call it, um, applies to the presidential proclamations on the previous screen. And I'll back up just for a second so we can look at those. So all the PPs, um, basically the answer is no. It, it, there are some, some exemptions and some exceptions that we'll talk about, and that, that is where the NIE comes into play. But as a general matter, if um, unless you fit into a, a very specific set of categories, the general answer is no. Whereas with the U.S. border and with, um, with Canada and Mexico, um, the, the largest prohibitions are land travel. So by car, um, by passenger rail, by ferry, um, I guess across... Um, you know, from US, Canada, you know, from a river or something like that. So generally speaking, um, flight uh, to Mexico or from Mexico, not to Mexico, from Mexico, from Canada is okay. Um, interestingly enough, uh, sea travel from Canada to the US or from Mexico to the US is okay. Um, essential travel, and we'll talk about what that means from Canada to the US or from Mexico to the US is, is okay. But if you're a tourist, you're entering from Canada or entering from Mexico, the answer is no. If you're not essential, and again, we'll, we'll talk about what that, what that can mean, the answer is no. 
So on one hand, with the presidential proclamations, talking about Iran, China, Brazil, the UK, Ireland, and the Schengen area, the general answer is no. You have to fit, basically you have to prove you have an exemption. Whereas with Mexico and Canada, it, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, but generally if you're not traveling by car, the answer is yeah, sure. Okay, so really important exemptions. Um, and this is what uh, kind of where the NIE comes into play and that previous slide, and I'll back up just for a second. So again, on one hand, we have the generally no for the presidential proclamations and the yes, if it's not by car or by land travel for Canada and Mexico, but these are the specific exemptions and how they fit into play. So uh, first I'll start with the, the, uh, the borders with Canada and Mexico, That's, it's a smaller list. So again, general, generally air and sea travel are okay. Um, even if, um, uh, now I, I think along that line, if you're a tourist and you're flying to the US, you could certainly have to answer a lot of questions. Um, but generally speaking, air travel and sea travel do not apply to the, um, the border restrictions. Um, obviously US citizens and legal are lawful permanent residents, uh, international students, um, humanitarian emergency, medical treatment, those are gonna be allowed. Um, international travel. So if you're a, a long haul trucker and you're driving from, you know, from Texas to, uh, you know, to, to central Canada, as long as, again, you can verify that you're going to be fine. Diplomatic, of course, military and then essential business. And again, we'll talk about what that is uh, here shortly. So it, again, it, it is a lot less restrictive than the presidential proclamations. And, and largely it breaks down to if you're not driving by car, and if you're not just a just a plain tourist, you probably will be able to enter from the U.S. and from, from excuse me, enter from Canada and from Mexico. Though again, um, and, and I think it's really important to apply to to remind everyone here, and we'll do it at the end. Every situation is different. Um, this NIE thing is, as uh, Reinhardt mentioned a few moments ago, is relatively new. It basically was invented out of thin air. Um, when these restrictions were enacted and there was a, um, this very small paragraph in the presidential proclamations that unless you basically can show some other exemption and the specific language was um, uh, down at the bottom, you'll see it on the, on the left here, in the national interest or no significant risk of viral transmission. And um, I think in the immigration community, we all circled that and said, well, what does that mean? There's, there's, no, there's no interpretation there. There's no guidance there. And this was in, um, you know, obviously back in March and, and basically since that time. And, um, and largely this, this whole procedure has come into play in the last, you know, three months, three to four months where we really kind of understand what this means. And similarly for the, the Mexico and Canada border, um, at the ground level, it is, it, is, it is very tricky. Every port of entry is going to be slightly different. And so every fact pattern, every circumstance is going to be slightly different. So it's really important if you plan on making use of these, that you understand that um, definitely, definitely uh, contact where you're going, um, have really good documentation, and just be just be ready to answer questions. Um, and so moving to the travel bans on the left, again, U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents and their spouses, um, parents and guardians, siblings of U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents if they're under 21 and unmarried, Obviously, children of U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents, um, many international students, particularly those with visas, um, of course, diplomatic, law enforcement, national security, those are allowed. Um, air and sea crew members, which makes obviously good sense, um, military personnel, spouses and children. And I have those starter asterisks uh, because those are all automatic express exemptions in the, uh, the presidential proclamation language. And all of those a couple of slides back, all of these, these PPPs, all of the, are PPs, not PPP, all of these basically have the same language and they, they build on one another. And so all of these, these, um, these indicated are automatic. Now, what does that mean? Um, as we found out with some of our clients, um, you still need to have good documentation. Make sure you have, if you're traveling with a child or if you're you know, the parent of a U.S. citizen, make sure you have proof of that relationship, proof of citizenship. Make sure you've um, fully documented that, you know, if you're traveling with a child, you have permission to travel out, uh, outside the country. Um, and I think it's still, 
it's still beneficial to reach out to the particular consulate or the embassy if you're using one of these these um, these uh, NIEs for you know let's say again you're a you're a parent of a, a minor U.S. child. It's still beneficial to reach out to the consulate or embassy and, and essentially get their approval, get their thumbs up to travel. Um, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, early, especially early on, back in the summer, we absolutely heard cases of individuals who felt as though they met these requirements and they were stopped at the airport or they were denied admission to the, the plane, they could board the plane because they just didn't have that thumbs up from the consulate or the embassy or CBP. And so it is, um, you know, I, I think now we understand how this process works. That's happening a lot less. But I, I think, again, the ability to, to plan ahead and seek essentially permission to even though we have these express requirements, still recommend it. Um, and we've done it for clients. And I think it's, it's a very valuable to have that piece of paper, to have that, that thumbs up from, you know, the, the U.S. government, be it, the, be it CBP or be it the Department of State that you know, a particular individual is free to travel because of this particular exemption. Um, so while you're at it, and there was one question from one participant posted, which is close to what you just said. Um, it reads, can you elaborate on the current rules if family members of permanent residents, not citizens, are allowed to visit? Sure, absolutely. And so again, on, on the, the left here, um, if we fit into to one of those categories for either a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident, um, you have an automatic exemption. Now, again, you still want to have, or we highly recommend, you know, basically writing to the consulate in the NIE process and saying, here's, you know, I am, um, I'm a, again, a parent of a U.S. minor citizen. Here's, you know, the birth certificate. Here's the proof of parentage. Here's the, um, the, you know, the, the U.S. child's passport or birth certificate or something, you know, of that nature. Please grant me an NIE. Um, same thing if you, you have siblings who are, again, uh, the third level here, citizens are siblings of U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents if both are under 21 and unmarried. Um, so that's a very specific requirement. So if you had, you know, two 18-year-olds or let's say that they're, they're twins, um, both are under 21, obviously both are unmarried in this particular fact pattern. If one is a U.S. citizen or one is a lawful permanent resident, the other could enter. Um, again, parents... Uh, spouses. So it's, it's a very basically immediate nuclear family where this fits. If it's a, um, a more extended family, you do, you will need some other basis for the NIE. Now, again, um, if you look down at the bottom here, we have uh, the COVID containment and mitigation. We have no significant risk of virus transmission in the natural, national interest. Of course, beyond the 14 day limitation, which I'll talk about in just one moment, and humanitarian emergency. So if, um, if someone is traveling to see a, 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 a direly ill, you know, let's say a, a, a grandmother or an aunt, uncle, um, you know, adult sibling, you're traveling, you know, back to, let's say, Germany um, to, to help them or to visit them, there are allowances under this NIE structure for those types of situations. Um, you know, I had to travel because I had to assist with, I had a family emergency. We had a medical emergency. So, you know, humanitarian nature, the humanitarian need is absolutely accounted for here. And of course, again, that's, that's why it's so important to remember that, that facts and circumstances matter. Um, there is no, though, though I think we have a, a really good picture from an economic perspective of, of what is going to be granted and what is potentially problematic with the humanitarian side, it's just going to depend. Um, and so it's just, it's just really important to remember that there's, there's no specific answer. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer here. It's can you build a compelling story for the need for travel outside the U.S. and then the need to get back in? So, again, going back to the question, right? I know it's, it's a, a long-winded answer to a, uh, to, a, to a direct question. If we don't fit into those specific categories, we have to just build a good story. We have to build a good reason for the travel. Um, and it needs to be compelling in many cases if it's not these express purposes. Um, of course, this does go without saying or, or should be said that this, um, the 14 day limitation for these, these presidential proclamations is a way to get around this. And we have had clients who they go to a, an, an unrestricted area um, outside 
for example, the Schengen area or they outside of Brazil or um, the UK or Ireland, they wait, I'd say 15 days, but they wait, you know, 15, 16 days. They can then, if they have a direct flight to the US or a connecting flight to an unrestricted area, they can then fly in the US, to the US. So that's the long way to get around this, but, but it is possible if we don't fit these other ways or if there's just not enough time to do that in terms of writing to the consulate or writing to CBP or writing to the embassy and getting an answer back. So it is really important to remember that there's always a way around this. It just could be the quote, the long way. And that is traveling to an, an unrestricted area for 14, 15, 16 days, and then entering the U.S. from there. Um, so at the bottom there, in the national interest, and that's what we're talking about. Um, a lot of these have been couched or fit under the national interest. And if, if you really think about it, the bottom half of that list on the left with the, the travel bans do not apply, those all kind of fit under the national interest. And um, what we've taken the approach, and I think many immigration attorneys who've done this have taken the approach, is that we're just going to say everything's in the national interest. Um, and not everything, but anything in, in these categories fit. And it, it does make a, a good, compelling argument as to why that's the case. So let's look at, at some of what these things are. So what is the national interest? Um, so, for example, um, we've had very good success with uh, U.S. businesses in distress. Um, obviously, it's a very trying time for many businesses both here in the U.S. and globally. So the notion that um, we have a critical business in the U.S., it is, it is failing or not succeeding or struggling due to COVID. I need to get in the U.S. or I need my people in the U.S. to help mitigate damage and to preserve the business. That is a very effective way of getting an NIE exemption. Um, in, in fact, you know, again, 100% 100% success rate. Obviously, we can never provide a guarantee because facts and circumstances do matter. But in this particular case, that is a very effective way to get it. And in, in many cases, unfortunately, businesses in the U.S. are struggling. Businesses globally are struggling. Um, with that, the second level is you have a U.S. essential business under the, um, the, the CISA guidance that came out in March. They had a, a many, many industries and many, many sectors that were identified as critical to U.S. infrastructure. Um, transportation, medical, medical supplies, um, obviously airspace and national defense and things of that nature. But it actually was quite raw, food supply, uh, key supply chains. And so um, in, in a lot of manufacturing, a lot of um, uh, anything related to that supply chain. So even if someone is a, their business is, is a, a middleman business moving, you know, plot supplies from a manufacturer to an end user or to another producer, Basically, anyone who fits into those supply chains for really key sectors, they were, they were labeled an essential business. And so we still use that, um, especially with a business distress or with significant U.S. employment or even with key business opportunities. We use that to emphasize the importance and the, the um, essential nature of, of why they need to come in. It quotes in the national interest. Uh, again, with that said, uh, significant U.S. employment, that's always a, a great way to go about this, simply by saying we employ dozens or, or several hundred workers. Um, obviously, COVID is making business life more difficult. We need our people to get in or I need this, this employee to return because we just need to keep momentum going. We want to keep the lights on, so to say. So, um, and then also key business opportunities. We've had very good success with our companies coming and saying, hey, we have this, this very crucial project or, or we want to start a crucial project. We need, we need people in the U.S. to do this. Here are the individuals. Here are their qualifications. And it's not unlike applying for an e-visa or um, an L visa or something like that. It's, it's very similar in terms of how we set these up, although they're, they're much, much shorter, much more truncated than, than that type of process. Um, investors and traders are largely able to come in. That's per guidance that we'll talk about in just a second. And then uh, critical overseas travel. I had a, a key business meeting in Europe or a key business meeting in Asia. Um, again, an emergency and family humanitarian needs also. Um, I think the, the best way to do this, and this is what we really try to do, is to layer multiple of these. And so if we can fact stack, you know, three or four of these into one story, um, then the NIE becomes very, very compelling. And I think it has a very good chance of success. Even if you have one or two of these, it's still, I think, still good overall. But what we do try to do is, is, is 
combine several of these together and and you know create this this really compelling story that that you need to enter the U.S. under this particular set of circumstances. Now I do want to caveat this um, just based on where our viewers may or may not be. The State Department has very clear guidance. They put this out a few months ago. Very clear guidance for individuals in Ireland, the UK, and the Schengen area. So everything we just said absolutely 100% applies in those areas. And if you're in those areas, I think your chances of getting an NIE are very good generally. And if if we can hit you know several of these, one or two or three of these that we just talked about on the screen, I'd say it goes very good to very very good. I, I can never say guarantee, but it becomes where we really don't really worry about an approval. Um, if you're not in those areas, there is no specific guidance. And so we would still rely on these things. We would still do these things. Um, we are still having success. Other immigration firms are still having success, but it just means it's not quite as certain. It's not quite as for sure. So it just means that, that we, again, we have to just compel, tell a compelling story as to why the travel was, was essential why coming back to the U.S. is is essential and important and necessary also. Um, one note, and we got a lot of questions about this after our last discussion where we we're outlining all of these generally. Um, you do have to submit the national interest request or exemption the NIE request once you leave. And so the, the, really, the real intent of the program is for someone, again, who must travel they have a business meeting in, in, in Europe or a key business meeting in Asia. They have a, a, a medical emergency, again, in those areas with family or with, with you know, some type of friend or they, they just simply must travel. And then they're looking to get back into the U.S. and, and why that's necessary and why re-entering the U.S. is in the national interest. And so, unfortunately, we, we can't do a prophylactic request, you know, weeks or months before someone travels. It has to be once they leave. Um, which obviously adds a layer of risk, which is why I think it's so important that we we do and we have been able to largely, you know, take these these um, these lists here and and have two or three or four of these apply to one petition, one request, and again that gives it a very good chance of success and approval. So just something to keep in mind: we do have to submit these once um, you know someone has departed the U.S. or they're outside of the U.S and they're, they're waiting to return. So I, I can imagine there are a lot of questions about, can I travel for the holidays? And can I then get an NIE once I'm there to come back? So obviously this would fit under the humanitarian category, but I would say we definitely want to pair this with something else. So maybe there's a business meeting overseas, maybe there, is um, excuse me is a um, a, a need to meet with the the parent company or a need to to meet with uh, you know business associates overseas. Maybe there is a um, some other really important business or economic or or family need other than just traveling for the holidays. Um, especially with uh, unfortunately cases continue to rise here in the U.S. As, as probably many of you know, it is I think going to be difficult it's going to be that much more important that we show a compelling compelling reason to come back to the u.s um, just because our numbers here are going to be going to be not so good so unfortunately and likely so so it's um you know i would caution you if if you if you think you're going to travel for the holidays or if you want to travel for the holidays um you definitely you know reach out to us or or you know reach out to someone before you do so that way you can you know, feel confident or not as to whether you will be able to re-enter. Um, we already have several clients who are traveling and we simply are gonna submit the United literally as soon as they land in their destinations, we're gonna submit them and, and hopefully we get a, a positive result. And um, now with that said, what happens if an NIE is denied? You always can request another one. Um, in fact, we've done multiples for several, not because they've been denied, but because they were accepted. They came to the U.S., they went back, and then they needed to come back to the U.S. again. So in NIE, um, there is some guidance and suggestion out there that NIEs, at least in some locations, are literally a, a one-time thing. That has not been our experience where, where we have been seeking NIEs. It has been, if you come in, it's one entry, 
if you have to go back out, you simply need another one. And we have done that with success and they've been approved. So um, if something happens and an IE is rejected or you know, you're now facing another need to travel, simply submit another request. There's no limitation that I'm aware of that I've read about on the number of requests that one can submit. Um, so I'm sure there may be some questions on this, but we'll, uh, we'll come back to that if, if there are. Well, I guess, I guess while we're here, while I'm moving, are there any questions so far on, on anything that we've talked about or on this specific issue of travel if for, just for holiday purposes? Reinhardt, I see you're talking. I, I can't hear you, Reinhardt. If you're, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Thanks, Andrew. So one of the questions is about the timeline and I'm not sure if you're covering it later. So how long do I need to plan? So if I need to be in the United States, let's say in the first week of January after the holiday season is over, is it now timely enough or am I too late for that? Excellent question. And, and there is a slide for this later, but that, it's, I think it's a great time to talk about it now. Um, so the times are getting longer. Um, you know, I think uh, three or four weeks ago, um, obviously we submit a lot of these to the, the, concert, the, the consulate in, in Frankfurt. They were responding in less than three business days. Um, it was incredibly fast. I really appreciate um, what the, 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 the folks in that office were doing. Um, that time has, has, you know, has begun to back up a little bit. And, and their communications, they're saying they're getting lots and lots of these requests. And so I would say at this point, we're probably looking at seven business days. And I think as we get closer to the end of December, we're going to be looking at probably, unfortunately, probably closer to 10 business days. So um, if you have these or you're thinking about traveling, think now is, is a good time to get these in. Certainly before we get to that, that December 20th, December 21st time frame when, when um, you know, work largely stops in, in many places around the world, it really starts to slow down. Um, including the consulates, they're going to start having holiday hours and, and less staff. So, um, yeah, I, I think right now it's still probably in that five to seven, maybe slightly longer, you know, business day time frame turnaround. Um, but, but it is, it is probably likely to get longer. Um, and I, I don't have a great feel for how much longer it might get, but I think, I think seven to 10 business days is, is probably a pretty good guess. If you're asked, if you're applying in say January 2nd, I think seven to 10 business days is what I would, I would say in response to a client's question about how long. Okay, brilliant, thank you. So um, going back to kind of our gatekeepers, uh, who gets the NIE request? Um, and the answer is unfortunately, the lawyer answer, it depends. If you're, um, if you're abroad, well, I guess everyone's abroad, but if you're in the Schengen area, if you're in the UK, if you're in Ireland, um, probably going to start with a consulate. They have very specific rules. I know the, the, the U.S. missions in Germany, they have very clear rules about where these, where these need to go. Same with Italy, same with UK, very clear rules about where they should go. So you're probably starting with the consulate. Um, the only difference there would be if you're an ESTA holder versus if you're a visa holder or you're applying for a visa. Um, if you're an ESTA holder, in some cases, you can go straight to CBP. You, we'd actually would apply to the, um, the port of entry here in the US. So uh, for example, the JFK you know, uh, airport in, in New York, that's a very specific and I think very popular NIE port of entry that we're sending these to. Um, but not every airport has it. For example, here in Charlotte, they, at least as of, as of uh, recently, they do not have this ability to adjudicate NIE. Um, same with Atlanta. So we have to go to those really large airports, really large cities, you know, uh, LAX, um, Houston, Dallas, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Boston, New York, those types of places. And then you can connect from those, those locations to, say, Charlotte or to Atlanta or to another location in the U.S. Um, and I think a really key point here, and then we'll emphasize this again, if you're dealing with CBP, um, you are probably, unless they change these rules, and I, I don't think they're going to anytime soon, if you have a CBP approval, so not the consular, you know, NIE where it's been approved and now you're flying to the U.S. and you're dealing with CBP simply at entry. If you have an, a CBP approved NIE, you are going to have to go to that specific airport uh, to start with. So if you, again, you're flying from uh, London, 
yeah, you have a, a JFK a port of entry approved in IE, you have to go to JFK first uh, before you can connect anywhere else. Um, it is, so it's not transferable. Whereas a, a consular approved in IE is, is basically good anywhere. And so the key thing is going to be getting on the plane in Germany or getting on the plane in the UK, getting on the plane in Italy or France or the case may be. And so once you get on the plane to fly the US, you simply become a regular, you know, a regular traveler, you know, pre-COVID or post-COVID, hopefully here pretty soon. So that's a really key difference and distinction. Where am I submitting this? Who do I, who, you know, who am I submitting this to? How long? Um, and then what are the, the kind of the post-approval requirements? Um, again, I'd still say five to seven, maybe 10 business days for all of these. It's probably going to get a little longer for each, but, but basically um, everyone's been responding in a pretty timely and effective and efficient manner. And again, I just to kind of reiterate, it depends on where you're coming from. Um, it, it primarily is about location um, unless you're a visa holder. So for example, um, uh, several countries have very specific requirements if, um, if and by countries, I mean the Department of State, if, if those particular embassies or consulates have issued, say, an e-visa, they have very specific requirements that you have to go to their e-visa unit and get an NIE approval. Um, others, it's about location. So it's not about citizenship or not about a visa approval. It's simply about where you are, where are you located currently when you apply for this. So it really does depend at the very granular, granular level about where you are, what kind of status you have with regard to U.S. immigration, and then what you're looking to do. Um, again, they do have very specific rules. And, and this is where that you know, know your gatekeeper kind of comes into play, is that what works, say, for the, the Frankfurt consulate may not be what the London embassy requires. It may not be what the Rome embassy does. Their processes are a little bit different. And we even see this with the CBP ports of entry. Their processes are slightly different based on where you're going. And so just really dial into those rules. And, um, and obviously we'd be glad to help. I highly recommend that, that, that we help out with this, um, not to, to toot our own horn, but, but I think we have a pretty good handle on what, what is required and, and how to do this. Um, at the bottom, I think a question that was asked previously and, and something that, that definitely can matter, must I have a visa? Must uh, someone seeking an IE have a visa? The answer is no. Um, with certainly with regard to the UK, with Ireland and the Schengen area, um, ESTA holders can absolutely apply for NIEs and absolutely get them. Um, outside those areas, we certainly would try, but again, there's no clear guidance. The State Department has not put that out there. And so it would be more of a, um, you know, I don't say trial and error or, or, or the quote macaroni approach where we just throw something and see what sticks, but it is certainly less certain. Um, where with, if we're talking about these three areas, we have fair certainty as to if, if we hit certain requirements and if we do certain things, we're probably going to get an approval. Um, but then with that said, the visa certainly makes it easier. And I would say this is broadly, you know, from a global perspective, if you have a visa, if you already have a status, getting this NIE is going to be easier. Um, one of the things that, that we have seen done, and I think it's really important for, um, for maybe our, our viewers who are considering new visas or considering visa renewals. If you do it during this time frame, while these are going on, we have had clients um, who are able to get a stamp on their visa that they basically have, as, as we interpret it, and I think as most immigration community interprets it as a, basically a perpetual NIE um, while this is going on. Um, I, I think that's, we, we have a handful of clients who've been able to get those um, that is uh, kind of the gold standard of NIEs. Um, and so most NIEs, if you just get, if, let's, for example, you have an E visa holder now or an S to holder or an L visa holder or something of that nature, and you're trying to return to the U.S., that NIE, regardless of where it's granted, CBP, consulate, embassy, doesn't matter. It's going to be a, a one-time deal. And they're good for 30 days. And so if an NIE is granted today and I hold an, already hold an E2 visa, I have 30 days early January to use it. Once I enter the U.S., I need another one if I leave and want to come back. But if you get the stamp on your visa, um, as we interpret it, it is basically a perpetual NIE so long as these proclamations, these presidential proclamations 
are in place. Um, to be honest, I don't think we've had a client test this yet, but from everything that I've seen and, and in looking at how these are worded on the visa, I don't see how there's any other conclusion that it is a perpetual uh, NIE grant until these presidential proclamations are um, abated or relieved or removed. Hey, so, Andrew, uh, we got another question. Sure. Um, with the vaccination starting soon, is there any prediction on when the travel ban could possibly be lifted? Great or question. Can be, or can it be expected within the next few months? Great question. Um, and, you know, I think we had similar questions, um, you know, back, you know, six weeks ago. And, and I think the larger question with, with any of these COVID-related restrictions on visa issuance and, and entry is when, when can we expect abatement? And I, I think the answer still is I, I don't see it anytime soon. Um, you know, I, I've been reading a lot of the immigration, you know, kind of network literature and, and just general news. And I think the general consensus, excuse me, the general consensus is that um, with the new administration in, in January, with COVID, there's just not going to be a lot of changes. Um, and I think that that is um, from a practical perspective, you know, uh, you know, President-elect elect Biden ran on the platform of, you know, he's going to have more common sense, you know, COVID measures. And so I, I think it seems contrary, or I think just from a, a logical perspective, seems contrary to remove these, you know, come January 21st. Might the vaccine make a difference? You know, might hopefully um, a, a more standardized mask policy or those type of policies, um, you know, impact this? Certainly hope so. I think we all hope so. Um, but I, I really do think these restrictions are going to be in place, certainly in the first three to four months of, of next year. Um, and, and I think most people largely see us getting back to normal maybe next summer. So um, I think if, if, if you're planning on a visa renewal or planning on U.S. travel, um, probably in the first six months of, of 2021, unfortunately, we're probably going to be living with this. I, I, I certainly hope we're not. I certainly hope I'm, I'm terribly, terribly wrong. Um, but, but I think just as a, from a planning mechanism, um, you know, if, 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 you know, you're a client, you're calling me tomorrow and saying, you know, what do I do if I have a visa renewal in April? I, I'm thinking we're going to be dealing with this in April. Uh, I think that's, that's what I, I, that's how I would treat it, how I would plan for it. Um, and then hopefully we're wrong and, and, and we're back to normal by then. And Andrew, you just triggered a thought I had is because I always get this question, how long does a visa application run these days? We had an extreme slowdown during the hype of the corona because the consulate was not working. But if all things are even, and I'm starting an e-visa today, when can we expect to be processed in Frankfurt, for example? Um, well, I guess there's, there's two parts to that. Um, I think general like interview processing and scheduling seems to have largely caught up. Um, so we have clients and we've had several in the last couple of weeks who've been able to schedule interviews in, in basically two or three weeks, which is kind of the normal time frame. Um, in fact, I think for December, probably a little faster than normal. So I think if, if you're having a renewal, if, if you're having a new e-visa candidate, but you have a registered company, I think largely it's back to normal. You know, a couple of weeks for processing in terms of getting the application ready, a couple of weeks to, to the interview. So, you know, let's say six weeks, just to be generous, six weeks and, and you can have a visa in hand. Um, what I don't have a great feel for at this point is what happens if, if it's a, if it's a re-registration, what happens if we have a new company registration, how long is that processing take? Um, I think on general experience, we're still getting closer to the, I think typically with, with, um, with most of the, 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 the countries we are with the, the locations we deal with, you know, probably four to six weeks is the general advice. I think we're getting closer to that, but I would still say we're probably still two to three months of processing versus the, the four to six weeks we might typically advise. So um, just very quickly with the, the Canada and Mexico borders, um, we talked about essential essentiality and what does that mean? Um, and again, the, the lawyer answer depends. Um, if we're talking about employment, let's say someone has a, a, an employment-based visa and they're traveling from Canada or from Mexico to work in the US, probably gonna be okay. If you work for or you're related or are doing business with the U.S. essential business, probably going to be okay. If you have some type of, um, um, you know, very particular status in the U.S. and, and status is a, I know immigration is a term of art, but in, in this case, I'm using it more broadly. 
if so really if you're not a tourist you're probably going to be okay um but but it if on the other hand it, it can matter and this again is where the port of entries matter if you're traveling by land really want to take care to know what the port of entry that you're entering requires they are largely free and do exercise their own very specific discretion with regard to how they treat this, how what what is essential. Um, in some cases, they are vetting work visas more difficult, uh, more difficult or more carefully, and with more uh, more rigor than other ports of entry. Same thing with um, if if you're not necessarily a tourist, but you you know claim how I've worked for or I'm doing business with essential business, I have a B visa or I have an ESTA, and I simply want to to come in and do my business, have my business meeting, leave. Um, some ports of entry. Are, are you know basically accepting that some ports of entry are, are applying much more scrutiny and so you what the key term is essential is what you're doing is essential and it really relates to again that central business that um, the cisa guidance and how this particular job or company or um, uh, industry sector relates to the u.s recovery relates to job growth relates to the economic um you know economic growth so though that's what's important um certainly if you're not a tour if, if you're a tourist if you're simply um you know some type of just generic visitor i think you're gonna have a really hard time getting past the land border um and in fact i, I would say probably assume you're not going to be able to get by it um so that always check by the port of entry or just fly um, again, air, air travel does not apply here. You may have to, I would be prepared to answer questions, be prepared for scrutiny. You may have to answer some questions and have, you know, present documentation. But by and large, if you go on a plane in Canada to the U.S. or from Mexico to the U.S., you're probably okay. Another really important point it's, that's, um, that we do sometimes get asked, what happens if I'm essential, but I'm traveling with my um, you know, my dad, or I'm traveling with a family member who is not, um, you know, not necessarily a spouse or a child, but it's, it's, it's more general. Everyone needs to be essential at the land port of entry. And so if I'm essential, but my, 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 my companion is not, my, tra my, my travel buddy is not, my dad is not, no one is going to be able to get in. They're not, <laughs> they're not going to let you, you know, put you down on the side of the road at, at the, the, uh, the border, and then you come on in, they're going to die everything. So, or likely to do so. So it's really important to think through, is everyone essential? How do we know? How do we prove it? That's, that's the really key, I guess, inquiries when you're dealing with uh, land travel. And again, if you have doubt, fly. Or I guess get on a, yeah, some type of cruise or something if those are available. So again, another question, I'm sorry, Andrew. Uh, another question is what happens if the person who needs to travel does not have a current valid ESTA? Excellent question. Um, I, I, technically, the guidance that has come out and, and technically the verbiage from the, um, the presidential proclamations is that those visas or that ESTA must have been valid as of the proclamation. But I can unequivocally say, with at least regard to, to, um, to many of the, the consulates and embassies in Europe that we're dealing with, they are not applying that standard. If someone, if someone has a valid ESTA, so your ESTA has run out, you get another one today. If someone has a valid ESTA, they are adjudicating and granting those NIEs. And I know that for a fact, we've had those approved. So, um, and, and I was curious about that early on when we did have a few clients who had uh, had to renew ESTA or had to seek a new, you know, basically had ESTA for the first time. Um, you know, would that be an issue? And so far, at least to, you know, with our clients, as long as you have, as long as it's valid, so valid visa, a valid ESTA, even if it was issued today or last week or last month, if it's valid and you meet those other requirements, they, they can and do grant them. So um, it, with, I guess, specific question, that, that is not a real concern. If, if you meet those other requirements and we can build a compelling national interest story, we're going to get an approval. Um, so again, looking ahead, I think the travel bans and related bans are going to be with us for a while. Um, know your areas, know where you're traveling from and know what, you know, the goals of the travel, where you have to go to get the approval. Um, and if you are flying in the U.S. with airports, know your airports. Um, visa holders, 
And ESTA holders from many countries can fly, if they have consular or embassy approval, they can fly to any U.S. airport for the most, actually, I, they can. If there's a direct flight, they absolutely can. Um, but if you go to CBP for an approval, for whatever reason, if you go to CBP, you do have to go to that airport first. So just make sure that you understand and know where you need to go, where you have to go, and where you don't have to go. Um, and again, remember, NIE is only good once, unless you have that magic, uh, 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 I guess, golden ticket, so to say. Uh, you get it stamped on your visa. The NIE is a, is a one-shot deal. If you leave and need to come back in, we have to do another NIE. Are those granted? Absolutely. We've had them granted ourselves. So we do know that you can get multiple NIEs. Um, certainly, again, certainly from the UK, Ireland, or the Schengen area. Um, it's very clear. Outside of that, it's less clear, but I'd say still it's, it's absolutely possible. Uh, questions? I'm going to come up with, I'm sorry, go ahead, right here. Right here, I think you're muted again. Sorry about that. Brian Hard, you're still uh, you're still muted. One of the questions in the chat was, "How long is the NIE valid?" Thirty days. Thirty days. So if, if you get the, just the standard um, NIE, you already have a visa, already have ESTA. It's thirty thirty days. So if it's granted, if it's granted today, and they have very specific requirements, if it's granted today, they'll tell you, you know, we're granting this on uh, December eighth. You have 30 days from today or and most of the time they even put the end date you know you must enter by this date uh, for the NIE to be valid so how quickly are NIEs processed we've already talked about this i would say seven to ten business days is is a good guess at this point um, it may be a little faster it has been traditionally but i think at this point with the volume that we're we're likely to see um, across the board seven to ten days is probably a pretty good pretty good estimate or most approved it depends. Um, we absolutely know from, from you know, our immigration sources and from talking to others, they are absolutely denied. Uh, we have had very good success internally, um, but we've also had really strong candidates. So, uh, you know, um, you know ev everyone I've submitted, I think, you know, I, I really felt great that we were going to get an approval. I, I really didn't submit any that I, I thought were, were questionable or, or, um, or, 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 you know, even remotely weak. So, you know, I think if, again, if you're traveling for the holidays and, and holiday travel is your basis, um, I, I do think we ought to pair that with something else. I do think that is that is a little more a little more subjective. And, and given the numbers here in the U.S., given the volume of NIEs, I think if, if that's the only basis for the NIE, I think there is there's risk of, of being denied. Um, so just, just bear that in mind. I, I think for the most part, I think a lot of people are having really good success with these. Um, but but I, that doesn't necessarily mean that will continue. I think again the numbers here and the volume could could influence that. Um, NIEs and, and visa holders, you know, explaining a little better. So again, as I talked about, if 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 you don't have to have a visa, but it does make it easier. If you're up for renewal or you're thinking about renewal or thinking about a new visa, uh, getting that stamp. If the consulates and embassies issue it, um, I don't know that all of them are. I know the ones we deal with are issuing them. Um, if you get that stamp, that is essentially the gold standard NIE. And from everything we've seen and what we know, it is essentially a permanent NIE so long as the proclamations are in place. Um, again, if you don't have that, 30 days, and it's one, one entry. Oh, uh, I guess any questions coming in um, that we can answer or help with? Uh, yeah, Andrew, there's one more. Um, I read last week an article in the German newspaper. Uh, it mentions that there are rumors that the travel for Schind I can't say the name residents may be lifted um, in the near future. Do you know more about that? Um, I think there is a there's certainly a, a hope that could happen. Um, you know, I think, and this is where I, you know, I, I want to be careful. I, I don't want to, to mix in your know, personal views of, 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 you know, 
all of this with with um, with kind of the facts and circumstances of of, of just the, the law that we're dealing with here and the regulations that we're dealing with. Um, it certainly would make sense that um, that we would probably be much more likely to impact to encounter issues traveling elsewhere than, than people traveling here. I think by and large, just given when that happened, particularly with with the new administration, it certainly could. Um, but I also think that. Um, Given the, the, the success we're having, the, I think the NIE process and the the, the clear guidance with um, the Schengen area and with the UK and Ireland, um, if you have a, a, a reasonably valid basis for getting an NIE, particularly if you're a, a visa holder, particularly if, if you're an e-visa holder, you're an investor, investor or a business traveler or a, a treaty trader, or, or again, you're, you're you know, tied with or, or, or owning or managing a, a struggling business in the U.S., that NIE has an excellent chance of approval. And so I think, you know, projecting how this might go, as long as, as, as people who need these NIEs are able to get them, there's a clear process and there's not, a, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of wait time. I don't think there's going to be a lot of pressure to remove these generally. Um, and again, I think that that goes back to the optics and the um, uh, kind of related to to what the president elect had had basically the platform he ran on of of, of a, you know his words of a more responsible approach to COVID, and so I, I I could that be possible? Could that that the German newspaper have you know have some intel that we don't have? Obviously, we certainly hope so, um, but but I I just think here on the ground in the U.S. that. I think in the short term, certainly next six to eight weeks, that seems unlikely. Um, again, maybe February or March rolls around, the vaccine is, is out, numbers are trending down. Maybe, maybe that happens. Um, but, but I don't, I don't, I wouldn't expect any change, certainly before February, probably the end of February at the earliest. Any other questions? Hey, Andrew, yeah. Uh, are NIE requests for people with current visas more likely to be approved? I would say generally yes, but but I would say that that yes is 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 slightly qualified in that in in we've had all of ours approved. So you know, so far with ESTA and with Visa. We've had no issue. We've had the, the, the consulates or CBP have not pushed back on anything really. So I think the visa makes it easier. It certainly makes it easier to demonstrate, you know, the essential nature of the travel or the, 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 the economic or national interest of the travel. But is it required? No. Does it make them more likely? Yeah, probably. But, but if you have ESTA or does that mean you, you have an uphill climb? I would say, generally speaking, no. Yeah, I think it's more about the fit of the NIE and the the nature of the travel more than than the the particular status or lack thereof. All right, I don't see any more questions. Um, if we can just give it a couple more minutes, if anyone has any last second questions they want to get in, that'd be great. Beautiful. I mean, by the same token. Now is the opportunity to ask a question for now, but you can always ask a question later. You know how to get a hold of us at Bridgehouse Law. Charlotte at bridgehouse.law is an easy email address for all of us. And otherwise, it's first name dot last name. So you can reach Andrew or myself or anybody at our Bridgehouse team. And we're happy to, to answer those questions if they come up or if you need them, as in you may not need them right now because you're not contemplating an NIE because it's only valid for 30 days. However, if you realize in the middle of January, you need to come to a trade show in the United States, if they ever happen again, or if they happen in next spring, um, reach, out, reach out to us at any time. With that said, the promise to keep it short and sweet and very informational, we are now at the one hour mark. Andrew, thank you for the great presentation. It is always insightful to speak with somebody who does things like NIEs on a daily, weekly basis. So thank you for sharing your wealth of information today. And again, reach out to us if you have any other questions and stay tuned. We have more webinars to come and we have the next webinar scheduled for Robert. What is it in two weeks, I believe? 
Uh, no, just uh, next Monday. Next Monday, beautiful. And what's the topic, Robert? Um, Italian business with Monica. Monica Boccia, the dual admitted attorney who was admitted to practice in Italy as well as in the United States, is talking about Italian businesses entering the United States. So in a way, she's my Italian counterpart. Whoever would like to rush up on some Italian questions, that's certainly the opportunity. So with that said, see you next week. Thanks, Andrew. And thank you to all for participating. And most important, stay healthy and stay safe. Happy holidays. Uh, thank you, everyone. If you uh, check our YouTube page, maybe tomorrow, we'll have the whole, up, uh, whole webinar uploaded so you can send it to friends or whoever you think will find it useful. Thanks. Have a good day.